like, hey, thank you, this is an appropriate use of police power in these situations. Right? You are trying to save lives uh, in your uh, very little time to do so. Uh, so the other trend that's going on throughout the 1970s is the instant drug war. Uh, in this in the 1960s, Reagan ran on a very anti-crime platform. Uh, the idea that was to appeal to the uh, silent majority, by which he mostly meant white people, um, and to basically get elected by exploiting white fear of other crime. Uh, and there are a couple of uh, precipitating events that really helped Nixon. Uh, and one of them, of course, happened here in Austin uh, with the Texas clock tower shootings by Charles Whitman. And uh, one of the, uh, you know, at the time, white America was basically watching black America riot on their TVs every night. Uh, and it terrified them, but also, they could also, you know, remove themselves from them, right? They moved they were in the suburbs. Uh, they were away from all this crime and violence. Uh, it troubled them, but it wasn't something they had to worry about. Uh, after Whitman, uh, you know, Whitman opened fire on college students, right? Those could have been anybody's kids that were dropping on, on the, uh, the, the lawn out here. Uh, and it really kind of made crime uh, hit home in middle class America. Uh, Whitman himself was you know, a former altar boy, Marine, you know, he played the piano, he was a good looking guy. Uh, you know, it, it really kind of struck home in the, in the suburbs that you know, this was something that could happen anywhere. And so Nixon really drove this home in the campaign. And one of the issues that he really pushed for the campaign was the No Not Great. Uh, and this is a, there's a fascinating history behind the No Not Great. Um, it wasn't something, this was not something that police chiefs were demanding. Uh, it wasn't something that criminologists were saying, you know, police need to have. Uh, the no-knock rate was actually the idea of the brainchild of a 28-year-old Senate staffer uh, who was charged with coming up with uh, ideas that Nixon could run on in his campaign that would basically exploit and middle-class fears of crime. Uh, so it was a political ploy, basically, and, you know, given the ubiquity of the no-knock rate today, uh, it is of dubious origin. Uh, so Nixon declares war on drugs. Uh, he gets two no not great bills passed, one uh, that would apply to federal narcotics agents across the country, another that would apply just to Washington, D.C. Uh, the federal government, of course, has jurisdiction over Washington, D.C. And so Nixon basically wanted to use D.C. as his, his sort of test city or model city for these policies. A couple of interesting things happened. In Washington, D.C., uh, they had a very progressive police chief at the time named Jerry Wilson. He actually refused uh, to use the no not grade. He said it was evasive, it was violative of, of civil rights and constitutional rights. Uh, and he said basically that uh, there was no drug, drug offense that was so important that police officers should be allowed to kick down doors in the middle of the night. Um, interestingly, over the next few years, crime in D.C. actually went down while it went up in the rest of the country. Um, now, Wilson was a, had a lot of very good ideas back one of those we mentioned earlier. Uh, at the time, he took over the DC Metro Police Department in DC. Uh, two thirds of the police officers were white in the city that was 70% black. Uh, most of them were recruited from outside of DC and back to the far North Carolina and South Carolina. And one of the things Wilson really tried to do was uh, shift the balance, the racial balance of the police department, and also recruit from within the city. Uh, was one of the, really one of his high priorities. Uh, Wilson was, did a lot of things right, actually. Um, the other thing that happened, though, with the other bill was the National No Not Grade bill. Uh, and there it was used. And these narcotics officers, uh, federal narcotics cops across the country went nuts. Uh, they started just kicking down doors left and right. They were raiding houses without warrants. Uh, they were raiding innocent people, terrorizing people. Uh, and fascinatingly, I, I kind of blew my mind when I found this in my research. Uh, Congress called hearings, and they brought victims to these raids forward to testify. Uh, the New York Times and the AP did investigations. They found dozens of cases where people had been wrongly raided. And Congress actually had, as late as 1972 anyway, uh, still had the capacity to show some shame and remorse uh, and reflection. And they actually repealed both of the no-not grade laws. Uh, and in fact, not only that, they passed another law that made the federal government liable for any future wrongdoer raised by federal agents. Uh, it was really kind of a remarkable moment to show that uh, the drug war was not yet completely uh, intractable. Uh, so throughout the 1970s, we see these two ideas, two trends sort of continue on parallel tracks. You've got the SWAT team, the rise and spread SWAT teams, you've got the drug war, but they don't really converge until the 1980s. And we move the next slide. Uh, and it's really in the 1980s that the two, the two trends converged, and this is when we start to see SWAT teams now routinely used to serve drug warrants. Um, 
And so where SWAT teams used, were previously used uh, to, to basically employ violence to diffuse an already violent situation, now we see them used uh, to create violence and confrontation where there was none before, right? Now they're breaking down doors in the middle of the night uh, for people who are suspected of nonviolent consensual crimes. Uh, and that, the word suspected is important there too, right? Um, when you send a SWAT team to a bank, a bank robbery or a hostage situation or an active shooter, you are apprehending someone who has already committed a crime or is in the process of committing a crime, a violent crime. Uh, we sent SWAT teams into somebody's house in the middle of the night because you suspect there might be some drugs inside. Uh, you are using violence against someone who has not yet committed, you're not sure they've committed a crime, right? SWAT is now being used as an investigative tool, not as a response uh, tool to save lives. Uh, and this is overwhelmingly how SWAT teams are used today. Uh, the vast, vast majority of the 100 to 150 SWAT raids per day in the United States uh, are used to serve warrants on people suspected of drug crimes. Uh, although that, that mission is changing, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, so during the Reagan administration, what we really see is a ramping up of the rhetoric. Uh, Reagan at one point declares illicit drugs a threat to U.S. national security. Uh, we see dehumanizing of drug offenders. Uh, drugs are really painted as this existential threat, which is what you have to do in order to declare war on something, right? Um, I think it was Orwell who said, in order to, to, to declare war on an enemy, you first have to dehumanize them. Um, we see people like William Bennett, who was Reagan's education secretary and then later becomes uh, Bush the first uh, drug czar, uh, say things like, uh, he has no moral qualms with the idea of beheading drug dealers on television. Uh, at another point, he uh, said, and I'll, I'll use his air quotes, uh, it's a funny kind of war when you give the enemy habeas corpus. Right, so he's already, already talking about suspending habeas corpus with the drug war. Uh, and then you get Case, uh, who at one point said that drug users, not dealers, drug users, uh, should just be taken out in the street and shot. Uh, this is a position he later walked back when his own son was arrested for drug possession. Twice, actually. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and this is, and so this is a, a quote from a sheriff in Clayton County, Georgia. Uh, and the book is full of quotes like this. Uh, but we really see then this rhetoric trickle down to sheriffs, police chiefs, police officers, drug cops, uh, this idea that they're sold foot soldiers in a war. Uh, and this, this has been going on for a generation. Uh, incessantly, politicians have been telling cops that you're fighting a war, uh, that this is a battle. And you can see, I mean, when you think about it, this guy, this guy is, this is how he's referring to his own constituents, right? People who elected him, who ostensibly supposed to be serving, he's saying we should treat them basically like they're the enemy and we're storming the beaches of Normandy. Um, I'm going to read a, a couple, another quote to you that just went up this week. Uh, the Police One website, which is uh, kind of the go-to place on the internet for cops to rail about things, um, has uh, published a series of essays this week uh, specifically in response to my book. Uh, which is flattering in its own way, I guess. Um, and so one of the thing, one of the criticisms that uh, the, a couple of the has levied against me is that uh, I'm wrong about this. That cops do cops are not seeing the world in terms of us versus them. They're not seeing citizens as the enemy. But here's one of the essays that actually went along with those essays that made that criticism. Um, uh, and the headline here is uh, Police Militarization and an Argument in Favor of Black Helicopters. Um, so here he says, uh, Cops on the beat are facing the same dangers on our streets as our brave soldiers face in war. Uh, this is why commanders and tactical trainers stress the fact that uh, even on the most uneventful portion of your tour, right, referring to police officers' time on the job of the tour, uh, you can be subject to combat at a moment's notice. Uh, what is with this growing concept that SWAT teams shouldn't exist? Why shouldn't officers utilize the same technologies, weapon systems, and tactics that our military comrades do? We should, and we will. This, is, uh, this guy is the uh, SWAT commander, in, a sergeant and SWAT commander in the Sterling Heights, Michigan, uh, which I checked before I came on here. I had one murder last year. Um, clearly a war zone. Uh, next slide, please. 
So, a couple things to bring on to this. Uh, he creates, first he tries to bring the National Guard in to, to fight the drug war, because that's successfully, that's been happening ever since. Uh, he, uh, he tries to bring active duty troops in. That actually is one of the few horrible ideas uh, in the 80s that did not actually make it into law. Uh, but he creates these joint task forces, uh, which encourage the military to uh, share uh, information and share tactics with uh, local police agencies for drug interdiction efforts. Uh, the other thing he does uh, is he starts making Pentagon equipment available to police departments across the country. Uh, this is, you know, equipment that is uh, uh, built for war, for use on the battlefield. It's now being given to domestic police agencies for use on American streets, and American neighborhoods, and against American citizens. Uh, he then creates these, these anti-drug war grants that I talked about earlier, or anti-drug grants. Uh, so now, if you're a police chief or a sheriff, uh, you've got all this cool equipment that the Pentagon just gave you, right? So you might as well start a SWAT team. It's now you need to keep your SWAT team in long falls until, you know, you get a terrorist attack in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, uh, you know, or a bank robbery. Or you can start sending your SWAT team out on drug raids, which are actually going to generate revenue for your police department. Uh, so it was basically the perfect storm that Reagan created to uh, encourage the use of these kinds of paramilitary tactics for drug crime. This is a survey from uh, Professor Peter Kraska, who's a criminologist at University of Eastern Kentucky, uh, who's been surveying squad use for several years now. Uh, basically, he found that in the late 70s, there were about two to 300 SWAT rates per year in the US. Uh, by the uh, early 1980s, we were up to 3,000 per year. And by 2005, when he stopped conducting the survey, we were at 50,000 SWAT rates per year in America. Uh, so that's a uh, about a 1,500% increase since the early 80s, and about a 15,000% increase since the late 70s in the use of these kinds of tactics. Uh, next slide. Um, how, how long do I have? Uh, okay, I'm gonna have to move fast here. Um, ah, this is such a great story. Uh, if I see any of you later, remind me to tell you the story about me on. Uh, lot in South Carolina. Uh, can we move through the slides real quick? Uh, I want to get to a couple important points. Keep going. Keep going. These are all police departments, by the way. Uh, you probably heard the story about Stephen Seagal, who wrote the tank in the guy's living room. Uh, keep going. Keep going. 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 The camouflage always gets me. I mean, what are the, you're, one, you're conducting great, you, you, you really don't want to hide, and two, you're not creating Forest, right? Uh, keep going. <laughs> keep going. Uh, all right, so uh, this map, uh, we did this for Cato. Uh, it was kind of poignant. Each of these little red tags uh, is an actual innocent person who was killed in one of these raids. Uh, not, so they found nothing in these cases. No pot, no guns. Uh, they raided the wrong house and someone died. And there are about a little over 50, 52 of these cases now that I've found. Next slide. Um, so there are, are two really key moments that I want to emphasize here in the few minutes I have left where we kind of enter terrifying new territory. Uh, first is in 1996 where California uh, legalizes medical marijuana and the ballot initiative. Uh, several states that follow suit. Uh, the Clinton administration responds by sending SWAT teams in to raid these medical marijuana clinics. Now, up until this point, the argument from police agencies for using this kind of force was that they were facing uh, a violent threat, right? This is for officer safety. Uh, drug dealers are heavily armed. They're, you know, violent. They would kill a cop on a drop of a dime. And there were counter arguments to all of those, right? But at least they were making an argument that we need this kind of force because of the threat we're facing. Nobody be really believes that the hippie mom and pop couple that are running the pot shop in California are going to pull out an AR-15 from under the counter and kill a bunch of federal agents, right? Um, at this point, the federal government is using this kind of violence to make an example of people. Uh, these pot dispensaries are openly flouting federal law. Yes, they're operating openly. They're, they, most of them have business licenses. They're complying with state law. Uh, but they are openly flouting federal law. Therefore, we have to bring the boot down upon them. Uh, this is really kind of scary, right? And nobody really brought this up at the time. But the government was using violence to make a political point. And that really is not. Uh, something that we normally associate with the principles of a, a free society. And of course, we've seen this ever since. I mean, the raids on the Amish farms that are serving unpasteurized milk, uh, or, or selling unpasteurized milk products. 
again, nobody thinks that the Amish are a threat to kill a bunch of USDA inspectors, right? Um, but they are openly flouting federal regulations, even after repeated warnings, therefore we have to remove them and make an example of them. Um, the next uh, uh, really kind of scary new territory we enter uh, is in the last probably six or seven years, where we start to see SWAT get mission free uh, and start moving out beyond even the drug war to see raids on poker games. Uh, and actually, in the last few years, I'm seeing more and more of this. We're now seeing SWAT raids to enforce regulatory law. Uh, so, SWAT raids on bars, I think there's an underage drinking going on. Uh, in Orlando, uh, they used a SWAT team to raid a bunch of barber shops so they, uh, that were basically licensure inspections to make sure the barbers were properly licensed to cut hair. Uh, now, these were they know about these were drug raids, but they couldn't get enough evidence to get a search warrant, so they turned it into a licensure inspection, and now they can bring in the SWAT team without that pesky Fourth Amendment getting in the way. Uh, the worst thing is, so come over again, a lot of you may have heard the story this week actually about the raid uh, here in Texas, actually, in South Arlington, uh, on the organic farm, which again, this was actually a kind of in reverse. This was a code inspection. Uh, they thought that these people you know, had. Uh, a bunch of standing water and tires uh, because of the farms. So they had a lot of stuff around, and I guess the neighbors didn't like it. So these people were having a, a zoning battle with uh, the city, and the city responded by sending a SWAT team to raid the entire place. They ended up confiscating a bunch of okra and uh, blackberry bushes and tomatoes. Uh, very dangerous okra. <laughs> well, it was very, very dangerous okra. And actually, as someone who does not like okra at all, I had okra. I had to work up my outrage. Um, I'm going to end with uh, the Corey Gaines story because I think it, um, it, it, there was a kind of a poignant moment in the story uh, that it brought it all home for me a couple of years ago. So Corey Gay was, uh, you can actually just turn the slideshow off at this point. Uh, so Corey Gay was a uh, 21 year old uh, man at the time uh, who lived in Princeton, Mississippi with his girlfriend. Uh, they had just moved there a couple of weeks earlier. They had an 18 month old daughter, uh, and they had moved, you know, basically to start a life together. Uh, so Corey was home uh, by, by, well, with his daughter uh, on uh, the day after Christmas in 2001. Uh, his girlfriend was working at a factory. Uh, she worked a night shift at a chicken factory. Uh, so Corey was, was there with his daughter by himself. He wakes up about 12 30 in the morning, the sound of uh, people, somebody breaking into his house. Uh, he's laying on the couch in front of the TV. He moves back to his bedroom uh, where his daughter's laying on the bed uh, and pulls out a uh, gun that he kept on the nightstand, lays down by his daughter, basically hoping that the noises will go away. Uh, they don't. They move around to the back of the house. The door flies open. A figure dressed in black, and it's night, of course, uh, runs into the house. Corey fires three shots from his gun uh, and kills uh, the person who had just broken into his home. Police yell, police, police, you just shot an officer. Corey immediately drops the gun and surrenders. Uh, Corey has shot and killed a police officer. It's the son of the town police chief in this town. Uh, Corey was black, the cop was white. Uh, this was in Jefferson Davis County, Mississippi, uh, where race is a suffocating part of everyday life. Uh, now, there are two theories here, right? Either the state's theory, oh, Corey was arrested immediately, uh, beaten severely, uh, and charged with capital murder, which is the intentional killing of a police officer. Uh, now, there's two theories here, right? The state's theory was that Corey May was asleep, woke up, uh, 